caregivers, from the medical community, from journalists. There has been such appreciation that we have turned our lens on this very important issue. I also want to give a huge thank you to George Hicks, who's back there, who's co-producer and made our pieces sing. As and Jesse Costa, the man behind the camera who did those beautiful videos and slideshows. And just two more very quick thanks. I want to thank Martha Little, the news director for WBUR, for her editorial guidance. And I'd like to thank Charlie Kravitz, who is the general manager of WBUR, who is deeply committed to this kind of important in-depth reporting and who is wants to make sure in the years ahead that it maintains its central role in WBUR. So thank you, Charlie. We're going to get to the panelists in one minute, but we cannot do these stories well without the participants who are going through the challenges of this disease, for those who suffer from it and for their families. And I just want to recognize three people in this room who came forward to share their very painful and private journeys with us so publicly to help us tell these stories. Dennis Mareska Sr., stand up. Um, <laughs> Den Dennis's wife is 56 years old and suffers from Alzheimer's disease, so thank you very much, Dennis, for being an important part of this series. Uh, Ruth Fritz and Ralph Kelly. Uh, Ruth, Ruth's husband. <laughs> uh, Ruth is someone, the wife of an Alzheimer's victim, and, and Ralph Kelly is her husband who is suffering from the disease, so thank you so much. We spent countless hours in their house taking pictures, tape recording, intruding, being in their way, but uh, such an important service that they did. So thank you to all of you, and now Sasha, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And I wanna add that we do spend hours. Is this on, everyone hearing me? You know, we, we record hours and hours of tape, and then we go through it all and pick the very best. You know, Iris spent so much time with Ralph and Ruth, and the Dennis Maraska, your family had me come over one evening. I spent hours with them. Then a videographer came over again for another dinner for hours. So people really give a lot of their time to us to enable us to do these. So thank you very much. So we have three panelists tonight. First, I want to introduce Dr. Dennis Selko, who is truly recognized as a pioneer in Alzheimer's research. Ever since almost 30 years ago at this point, I think, he developed a way to isolate those tangles in the brain that are the hallmark of Alzheimer's. And he has do dedicated his career to, to studying both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's di disease. Mm -hmm. Formal titles are Professor of Neurologic Disease at Harvard Medical School and also co-director of the Center for Neurologic Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Both Dr. Selko and Dr. Bob Stern to his left are involved in clinical trials for Alzheimer's. Bob looks not only at the cognitive aspects of dementia, but also the emotional ones, and he's worked on issues involving dementia and driving, these very important practical issues, like at what point do you know it's not safe anymore to be behind a wheel. He's a professor of neurology and neurosurgery at BU School of Medicine. He also directs the Alzheimer's Disease Clinical and Research Program at BU. And you, you may know Bob as well because he's co-director of the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy, which does a lot of work on high school and college football player concussions, so Bob is often in the news for that kind of work. At the far left is Jim Wessler. Jim is president and CEO of the Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, which is right in Watertown. This spring, it will have been 14 years in that job. And Jim has spent 35 years in the nonprofit sector. He was the founder and executive director of a statewide elder advocacy group called Mass Senior Action <coughs> Council, which still exists and some of you may know. He has an MBA in healthcare management from BU, so he spent his whole career doing much of this work. We're going to start by having Dr. Selko, Dr. Stern, and then Jim Wessler spend a few minutes talking, and then I'm gonna ask some questions, and then we wanna open up the floor as quickly as we can, because I'm sure all of you have a lot of questions, and I think often the most lively panels are the ones where the audience is involved. So I, we'll start with Dr. Selko. Okay, thank you, Sasha. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, this is a, a station that I'm very fond of. I listen to WBUR all the time, but it's uh, particularly exciting to share a little bit uh, the, the sense of where Alzheimer's disease is right now, with uh, my distinguished co-panelists, and we're, we're all friends and colleagues. My uh, perspective is on research for Alzheimer's, and uh, I want to emphasize that we've learned an enormous amount about how this disease starts. For any disease, one wants to know the early stages, the beginning, and we've learned a lot about that. And even though you sometimes hear that there's a greater amount of debate, 
in Alzheimer research, that debate has pretty much settled into a common model of how the disease begins. And that means that we are able to start thinking of treatments that could be used very early in the course of the disease in people who have what we call mild Alzheimer's disease. They clearly have symptoms, they clearly are forgetful and with other symptoms, but they may benefit by intervening. Such trials are underway, so if we had this uh, meeting uh, just uh, a few years ago, we wouldn't be able to say that there are thousands and thousands of people around the world who are in clinical trials. Now, the truth of the matter is we don't yet know how those trials will turn out. That's why they're experimental. But we will know quite soon about some of the larger trials. And uh, we've already had some failures of trials, and I think if we have a chance later on, we can explain why those happened, that there are reasons why they happened, mainly because the drugs themselves weren't good. Some of the biggest trials we'll report out next summer, and then we'll know whether we're on the right track to slow the disease down. So uh, in closing my, my <coughs> remarks right now, I would say that as someone who's taken care of hundreds of patients with Alzheimer's disease over the years, I feel very much the terrible anguish that families go through and uh, there is uh, absolutely no doubt that scientists, physicians worldwide are incredibly committed to trying to help diminish that anguish, anguish by getting, uh, getting drugs uh, to patients, and that's already well underway right now. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you, uh, WBUR. Um, it's uh, an incredible honor to be sandwiched by these two gentlemen. Um, Dr. Selko is really uh, one of the world's uh, real leaders and pioneers in this field, so it's, it's truly a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to follow up with uh, what Dr. Selko was talking about by using one very important word, and that is hope. And I think any of you who are affected by this disease realize that the only way to get from day to day, to wake up that next day, is by having hope. And I can tell you that as someone in, in the trenches both clinically and in research with Alzheimer's disease, there is so much reason for hope that uh, the new trials for, for these drugs that Dr. Selka was talking about look really promising. And if the next one doesn't work, the next one after that might. We're really close. We're really, really close. We're also now in a new phase of our understanding of the disease by being able to diagnose it pretty accurately while someone's alive. I think most of you know that um, you know, even though we've known about Alzheimer's disease from, from, uh, for over 100 years, we still truly can't diagnose it unless we look at someone's brain after they pass away. But now, just in the last few months, there's been a new way to diagnose it that's recommended, especially for research at this point, by using objective biological methods to be able to have a pretty good understanding that this person has it before they pass away. The combination of our ability to diagnose people early and our wonderful efforts um, in developing new drugs that are going to change the course of the disease is what gives us hope every day. So thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, I, I want to extend my appreciation as well and, and also to WBUR. Uh, th uh, this has just been, uh, from the Alzheimer's Association point of view, just uh, really important to be raising public awareness and having this dialogue. Uh, I think I, Charlie, was mentioning to you that our, our phone calls at the Alzheimer's Association have catapulted um, just this week, as I think, clearly in response to, uh, to this series. On this, I want to briefly, uh, I often, when people say, what does the Alzheimer's Association do, I often talk about uh, three things, which is care, cause, and cure. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to I'm going to externalize it really. Um, as was mentioned, the, this is one challenging disease, and I'm I, I, I would echo Sasha's comments that many of you are probably experiencing uh, or have experienced Alzheimer's disease. It's an expensive disease. We know one third of elderly caregivers predecease their spouse. Uh, we also know one-third of caregivers uh, actually experience clinical, uh, clinical depression. Um, it, uh, it tears apart families. Um, um, it, it also is a multi-generational uh, disease. Uh, right today in Massachusetts, 
Uh, there are thousands of children that are coming home from school every day who are taking care of a grandparent with Alzheimer's disease. So, so uh, uh, it really uh, drains and calls upon the resources uh, of families. Now, the flip side of that is, is that we have learned a lot, uh, in fact, about effective caregiving and effective interventions. And while we are very committed to, to having uh, uh, Bob and Dennis and, and thousands of colleagues around the world to um, bring treatments to market. In the meantime, we have millions of people, uh, as you know, 5.4 million just in this country alone who are living with Alzheimer's every day. And so part of our work is to encourage uh, uh, families to get the help they need and do everything we can at the Alzheimer's Association. Just, so you, just in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, we assist about 25,000 people a year, and that's a direct voice-to-voice -voice or face-to-face -face assistance, and we need to do more. We know that. On the cause side, and again, I think this series is an example of uh, what WBUR has done, is to bring this conversation out of the closet, and I think we are making headway there. Uh, there is a stigma attached to this disease, as, as some of the stories that uh, um, have been aired in the last couple of days talk about. Uh, we need to do better. We need to mobilize uh, the American people. Um, this really is, uh, we believe, the critical health care issue of the 21st century that's affecting the boomer, boomer generation. I mean, there are a lot of health care problems, but if we don't figure this out, uh, we're going to have 10 million boomers with Alzheimer's disease. We're going to have up to 16 million Americans and probably upwards to 100 million people worldwide with this disease. So now is our opportunity, and that's why we need to get these folks the resources they need uh, uh, to, to ultimately being able to manage and really, I think, actually prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, last thing I just want to mention is the cure side, and not so much on the scientific side, because I wouldn't dare to, uh, uh, to do that with these two esteemed colleagues. But uh, again, as was mentioned, we're not putting enough resources uh, into the research side. The, certainly the Alzheimer's Association, um, we're actually the pro largest private nonprofit funder of research globally, but we're not, we don't nearly have enough money uh, to invest as we should. I'm pleased that both of you have received grants from the Alzheimer's Association uh, uh, previously, but we need to be able to do a lot more. And as was also mentioned in terms of uh, federal funding, which is really a key, key um, uh, piece here, the NIH funding, it just is sort of criminal. We're, we're, we're spending about $450 million a year for Alzheimer's research. And just to give you one example, um, uh, re uh, funding for uh, HIV AIDS is at around $3 billion. Now, we would never advocate uh, taking money away from another cause, and we've seen some of the incredible benefits uh, that we have made in other healthcare issues. But here we have an issue, uh, a, a, I should say, a healthcare um, um, dilemma that is affecting um, seven times, or, I'm sorry, five times more people, um, and we're spending one seventh of the amount of money on the federal government um, trying to find uh, um, a cure for this disease. It doesn't make sense. And really, the only way to do that is, in fact, to mobilize public opinion to try to change some of those priorities and, and, and policies. Um, so I'll stop there. Dr. Stern and Dr. Selko, uh, Jim Wessler had mentioned that a lot of calls came to, into his office this week, not surprisingly. And you had mentioned, as we were speaking before the panel, that a lot of them were people asking about testing. Yeah. Could the two of you clarify who can get tested right now? Because the reality is you can't just call your primary care physician and say, I want that test to find out if there's amyloid in my brain. So who can and who can't? People shouldn't be rushing to the phones exactly. No, the, the testing that people are hearing about now, this really new, accurate type of testing, is mostly in the research realm. Uh, we're using it in research studies all the time now, but we don't know for sure that it really is great, that it's perfect, and so more research needs to be done. And so people who participate in research can get this new type of testing. But everyone who has a concern can be evaluated, regardless of whether they can have these newfangled things. And it's really important that if someone does have a concern, either for yourself or a loved one, that they go to the doctor and they talk about it, that they say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not functioning the way I, th I think I should be. I'm having these concerns about my memory or my other cognitive or behavioral functions. Go to the doctor, uh, get evaluated, go to a specialty um, program that focuses on memory disorders, one of our Alzheimer's disease centers in the area. Um, do something to be tested where we can be tested now which is predominantly a clinical evaluation that if done in the right hands with people who are experienced in diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia can be quite good. 
So just because those newfangled tests aren't available to everyone clinically yet doesn't mean you should shy away from getting evaluated, diagnosed the best we can right now, and hopefully treated effectively. What if you're 30 or 40 years old and you're fearful? Is there anything at this stage you can do as far as testing? Or are you really focusing on people who are baby boomer age or above? Well, I think we're focusing on people who are older, who are really at, at the highest likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease, which is after the mid-50s or, or the early 60s or so. But we care very much about people who are concerned about Alzheimer's at an earlier age than that, who may uh, have symptoms or who have a family history. The most common thing I think that Bob and I and other clinicians experience is people coming in because their family history is positive for Alzheimer's. They may only be rarely at 30, but certainly at 40, 50, they come in and we can test them. We can give them cognitive tests and oftentimes reassure them that there isn't any objective evidence that there's something wrong right now. Uh, so I think anybody who has a concern about memory should see a clinician, but mostly we're focusing on the group that really has a high likelihood of being on the cusp of developing it, and that's people above 60 or certainly above 70 or so. The incidence climbs as one gets older. There's no really plateau. Even in the 90s, people get, uh, get Alzheimer's. I diagnosed a woman at 98 with Alzheimer's, and people would say, well, she's sort of entitled to have Alzheimer's at 98. Uh, but in point of fact, no one is entitled to have Alzheimer's disease or deserves to have it, and it can be diagnosed with some specificity that late. So absolutely, you should, as Bob said, go forward and get the right services. And frankly, uh, one hears this all the time from families, um, it's often only at specialty centers where they really, where patients and families get the real attention they need. There aren't enough specialty centers. We're talking to the Boston and Eastern Massachusetts community and Southern New Hampshire, et cetera. There are a lot of rich resources. And uh, Jim's organization, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, categorizes and makes those resources available to people. But in many parts of the country, and certainly in an awful lot of parts of the world, you can't come to a specialty center. Your listeners, however, would be able to do that, and that's where they'd probably get the most um, acute attention to the problem. A big realization in the field over the years has been that by the time people start losing their memory, that disease has probably been working at their brain for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there is a certain group of people who are almost genetically guaranteed to get it where, they, where there's the belief that the change is maybe happening in the teenage brain and you may be starting that early. Are we anywhere near the point that in the teenage years we can know whether we're prone and there's anything we can do about it? Well, it's really important to distinguish between the clinical part of the disease, the dementia, the cognitive difficulties, and what's going on in the brain. And we don't know exactly when those changes in the brain start initially. Teenage, maybe, but likely 20s, 30s, 40s, those changes in the brain that we refer to as being Alzheimer's changes have started. And it's decades or at least years, many years, before the person starts having the memory problems or anything else that they can really pinpoint um, uh, that would be the clinical presentation. So dementia is that clinical presentation. Dementia just means that someone has memory problems and other cognitive difficulties that get in the way of daily life. Um, it doesn't say that it's an illness or a disease. It can be caused by many things. And one of those diseases is Alzheimer's disease that ca causes probably 75% or more of the cases of dementia. And as that disease starts, it doesn't have any impact on the person's functioning. And that could be early in life. And as it takes more and more brain cells and ravages the brain more, that's when the symptoms begin. Jim Wessler, you made a reference to Alzheimer's sort of coming out of the closet. And you often hear, I often heard when I did this reporting, the idea that cancer used to be the big C, no one wanted to say the word. And then Alzheimer's sort of became the big A, where no one wanted to say out loud. Do you think we're past that point? I, I don't think we're past that point, but I think we're making progress. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I was actually uh, speaking with someone who used to work for the American Cancer Society, and, and he was telling me that in the early 1960s, doctors would not tell their patients if they had a diagnosis of cancer. Now, we can't imagine that today. They would not tell them that, you know. They, they, um, and obviously, at some point, the disease would progress. Um, so, I, so I don't think we're that 
bad right now, uh, but I, I think we still have a ways to go. We, we were even talking before the show. I mean, right now, the estimates nationwide are 50 to 70 percent of people t today in America are not even diagnosed with this disease. Most primary care physicians do not screen or diagnose for Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then you, you add on to that uh, denial um, uh, that's going on in the family. I see some heads nodding. Um, I mean, I went through this with my own family, with my father, and I work for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and, and um, you know, oh, you know, dad's always been that way. He's always been a little forgetful. Uh, you know, you know, he always asks the questions uh, uh, repeatedly. And finally, what happens is Bob was sort of saying is the symptoms develop and, and, and family members um, really need to be an advocate to make sure that they then get the uh, correct uh, uh, diagnosis in the medical system. I think the conversation is changing, though. Um, uh, this may seem like an odd example, but we do a series of walks to, to, to um, raise money and raise awareness for the, for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, this year we had 18,000 people in Massachusetts and New Hampshire participating, and that's a 50 percent increase over the last year. Um, now we worked hard at that, but I think that's also a statement um, that things have changed. When I started 14 years ago, we probably had about uh, 2,000 people participating. So I do think not only the numbers going, uh, gr getting greater, but I think there is a greater willingness to talk about this and to address, address this issue. Um, one of the another discovery in Alzheimer's is that this substance called amyloid is is what is believed to cause this disease. But just because you have it in your brain doesn't mean you're going to get it. Some people die, and it's found in their brain, and they never showed Alzheimer's symptoms. And Dr. Stern, you were also saying that there are now ways to remove amyloid. It's just not clear whether that's actually going to help you recover your memory. So there's still a lot of very basic things we're trying to figure out. Yeah, <clears throat> if someone has a certain type of amyloid in the brain, it's likely that they do have Alzheimer's disease, but it might not develop so quickly enough to be able to cause symptoms before they die, perhaps, of something else. But you're right. We don't know if just by taking out the amyloid from the brain, or all types of amyloid from the brain, it's actually going to have an impact on symptoms. Uh, some of the more exciting clinical trials right now are aimed at just that, at removing amyloid from the brain. And we're all very optimistic about it. I think it has a, a huge uh, amount of, of hope. Um, but there are some people who suggest that removing amyloid isn't necessarily the right thing because not all amyloid is bad. But fortunately, scientists, especially people like Dr. Selko, and I should let him talk about this, um, have found that there's many different types of amyloid. And we need to be able to figure out how to target the bad ones remove them and leave the good ones alone. Well, I'll add to that by saying that uh, there is a lot of complexity to this buildup of this small, sticky protein. The amyloid isn't the whole story by any means. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention because the genetics of Alzheimer's disease has elevated to uh, a primary position. There are certain genes that cause uh, terrible forms of Alzheimer's disease in people in their 30s, uh, sometimes 20s, in their 40s. And those genes directly uh, cause the, the, the formation of this amyloid. So that's very clear. The debate then is whether all cases of Alzheimer's disease have that kind of aggressive amyloid deposition. We know by definition that 100% of cases of Alzheimer's do have amyloid in the brain, but we don't know that the amyloid is unequivocally the major cause in 100% of patients. But the fact that it is an unequivocal cause in a small fraction of patients is what doctors have used for years in other diseases to say probably the general form of Alzheimer's is going to be similar to these rare familial forms. And um, right now, the drugs we use to lower amyloid in the brain, and they're all experimental, there's none that you can take right now, uh, will touch all forms of amyloid. And I don't necessarily feel that's, that's a problem because the only form of amyloid that would be normal, completely normal, is that form that babies have. They do have this same protein in their brains, and teenagers have, and people in their 20s have. But we'll never lower all amyloid forms to the point where we'll get down to baby levels. So we don't really, in my opinion, have to worry that we're overdoing it. It's like taking uh, statin drugs for cholesterol. Uh, the world has figured out that you can take statin drugs a certain way and safely, and if we ask you how many people in this audience were taking them, a lot of hands would go up, 
including mine, uh, the fact is that that doesn't lower my cholesterol level to toxic levels. Uh, we avoid that. We watch out. And we can even measure amyloid protein now, so we can, there are ways of knowing that we're not overdoing it. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the point Bob made. If we remove the amyloid, and we now have ways to do it, so that's, that's quite fantastic. We can actually remove one of the two cardinal abnormalities that Dr. Alzheimer called attention to in 1906. We can just take it out of the brain. And there have been a number of studies that that actually works. The question is, how early do you have to do that to prevent progression? And we, we don't know that, and these experimental trials are going to help us a lot. So in summary, there are ways to take amyloid out. Right now, we take all forms out. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of good forms of amyloid. I think they're almost all bad. Uh, and um, we'll see next summer whether taking them out of the brain helps people uh, slow down in their, in their decline. I want to turn to my colleague, Monica brady Myrov over against the wall. Monica's part of the story aired today. And if you heard it, you know that it opened up with Congressman Ed Markey. Was it Revere Beach, Monica? He, it had started out with these sort of lovely memories of spending time with his family on Revere Beach. And then he talks about how, it, and his mother had Alzheimer's, and his father was very determined not to have her go to a nursing home. So all of a sudden, Markey's explaining how the father had to tape his wife, had to tape the mother into the car to prevent her from leaving. And it just, it is a reminder of the impact that it has on people's lives. So Monica's story today was about this funding gap, that so much money now is going into particular uh, AIDS research and so forth, disproportionately much less for for Alzheimer's, so I want, um, so Monica is gonna ra raise some issues about funding. Yeah, and I wanted to touch on what Jim said at the beginning, that you don't want to be um, competitive with the other diseases, that the NIH is funding much more, uh, in a much better, in much way. AIDS is one, cancer is another. Um, but is, is, is there, though, a role to play that is more aggressive, honestly, in pointing that out? Because in all of the interviews I did on it, everyone notes there's this funding decline and that the pie should just get bigger. But I think everybody in the room here realizes that our pie is not getting bigger on the federal level or the state level anytime soon, and something needs to happen soon. So is there, a, is there any consideration to getting a little more aggressive about it in the lobbying with Congress and, yes, taking away from some other diseases where we have made significant progress? So I'm going to answer that yes and no. Um, um, no to taking money away from other diseases. Um, yes to be more aggressive. And certainly um, with the Alzheimer's Association, our, just observing our, our, our federal um, um, volunteer and, and professional team, um, definitely more aggressive on that front. You know, I think there are, there are a couple things. The, um, in fact, the success with uh, heart disease and cancer and HIV, AIDS, actually um, you couldn't have, and, and Dr. Selko uh, was just talking about uh, statins and high cholesterol, you really couldn't have a better argument for why you should be investing. Uh, if we actually look at the death rates for breast cancer, for stroke, um, um, prostate cancer, um, HIV, AIDS, those have, those have been coming down in the last eight years. Deaths due to Alzheimer's disease have gone up 66 percent in that same period. So to me, the message is, uh, to Congress, um, you have been investing very wisely and have reaped wonderful benefits. It's now time to also make a comparable investment. Alzheimer's disease will cost the health care system by the middle part of the century one trillion dollars a year. One trillion dollars a year. When we talk to pol politicians from Republicans and Democrats um, and we talk about, you know, if you could invest two billion dollars a year today, to save one trillion dollars a year 40 years from now, you don't get a lot of arguments over that. You don't, oh no, that, that doesn't make any sense. That, that resonates with almost anybody. So I think partly we just have to continue to push that argument and we need to engage a lot more people um, um, in making that argument. My question to the researchers is then, how much of this lack of progress or where we are today is because of a lack of funding? Is it really true that if we put a lot more money toward it, we're gonna see results faster? Unequivocally, yes. Unequivocally, yes. Um, we have the technology. Neuroscience has moved so dramatically in the last decade alone. Um, right now, for NIH funding, within the National Institute of Aging, on aging, which is funding the majority of Alzheimer's disease, only the top 5% of grant applicants get funded meaning 95% of superb scientists who submit a grant 
get it rejected. We're not going to be able to answer questions really quickly. Um, having adequate resources to be able to keep staffing going, to be able to keep labs going, to be able to go full force, or to double it so we can answer questions twice as quickly, that would be so important. But it's not the only answer. We also need, when we get to these points of clinical trials and diagnostic tests, we need people to participate in that research. No matter how much money we get to develop these new drugs and they become, um, you know, they look like they're going to have a tremendous amount of, of hope, when they get to those final stages of development, these phase three clinical trials, we need lots and lots of people to participate. So we need tons of money up front by NIH and others to be able to get to the point where we have the drugs that look like they're going to be helpful. And then we need people like all of you, like all the listeners, to be able to say, what can I do to volunteer to help speed the process? Um, it's always shocking for me when I hear that people think that there's enough volunteers out there to fill our spots for clinical trials. We're desperate. So it's money and it's people. Uh, Dr. Selko, let me ask you a question that came up a little earlier, but also I think is raised in this series, and that is that Alzheimer's is a fatal disease. Mm -hmm. That is true, as, as we went over. But I think a lot of people either don't know that, or and that's what some of the feedback I was getting from this series, maybe in part because of the ageism that's involved with the disease, that it's, um, it's just not seen. It's not seen what happens to a person at the end of their life with Alzheimer's. I'm wondering... Uh, how frequently is it put on death certificates? And is it, it's the sixth leading cause of death, but you were saying that it's also not listed many times. And, and there is a general, maybe not general, but a, a perception out there that it doesn't, that it isn't fatal. Right. So it unequivocally is fatal. It's a message we've been trying to get out for two or three decades. Uh, it shortens life expectancy. So if a woman has Alzheimer's disease at 75 and her uh, older sister uh, at 76 doesn't have Alzheimer's disease and other, everything else is equal, the woman with Alzheimer's disease is going to survive one half or two thirds less time than the woman who doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. So it really shortens life expectancy a lot. And there are many statistics that bear that out. When someone dies with Alzheimer's, they often die of secondary complications. And doctors, as well as families, don't really think of that as being due to Alzheimer's disease. Most of my patients, I'm sure it's true with Bob also, uh, die with fairly minor problems after a decade or two of Alzheimer's symptoms. They're really not able to move anymore. They're not able to speak. They can't take care of themselves. They can't even cough properly to clear their throat. And they die of sometimes very minor uh, respiratory problems, like just getting a little phlegm stuck in their throat. Or they develop a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, which normally one can cure. Uh, so that is what causes the death. It's a secondary complication. The Alzheimer's doesn't stop the heart from beating or keep the lungs from expanding. But that's true of many, many brain diseases. They destroy the brain. The person is still able to breathe and have the heart beat. But of course, what kind of life is that? It's, it's a terrible life. And so we need to encourage physicians and families to say, you know, my mother died of Alzheimer's disease. I noticed you said she had a cardiac arrest. Everyone has a cardiac arrest when they die. That's, that's, that's <laughs> essentially, I mean, virtually everyone. Uh, at the moment that you uh, leave, the, the, uh, leave, leave the earth, you have had a heart that no longer beats. And that wouldn't be an adequate reason. If someone has cancer, and they have a cardiac arrest, they say, died of a heart, heart attack, uh, but had a 10-year history of terrible you know, metastatic cancer. So that's a very important message. Going back to your question about funding, obviously I agree with Bob and Jim uh, very much, and 5%, uh, which is a, a terrible figure, because uh, the people who actually bother to put in grants to the NIH have to go through a lot of hurdles to create a reasonable proposal that has any chance many of those proposals would be worth taking forward. Now the NIH uh, trumped that low percentage by saying and you can only apply twice. We used to be able to apply three times. So you could apply with a project, you'd get a 10th percentile. And then you'd apply a second time with that same project, you'd get an 8th percentile, and you wouldn't get any more. Now after that second try, you're out. You can't put that grant in anymore, even if you thought it was a very good concept. 
So the funding climate from the federal government is very adverse. The Alzheimer's Association is doing the best it can to make up for that, and it's successfully fundraising. They're the two entities that do by far the most funding, but of course, not surprisingly, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, the, also, the uh, federal government is a much larger funder. We need to absolutely yell and scream at congresspersons of both parties that they have to trim the budget and they have to deal with this and they're going to have to take it from something other than brain research and, and Alzheimer's research. Not from the other diseases, but there are many other pies that they're already making very difficult decisions about and if they don't make them, we know they're going to be forced to make them by automatic cuts. And so this is the time to tell uh, our representatives, because they hold the purse strings, figure out something else besides medical treatments, which is the number one thing that voters care about, their own families, their own well-being, to make these cuts in. You've got to figure out something else that doesn't matter as much as curing Alzheimer's. Monica, if I could just add, I, yesterday I was in New Hampshire giving some Alzheimer's lectures. And I was in New Hampshire. I was expecting to be you know, run over by some politician who's you know, <laughs> going up there for the primaries. And I was telling them, you know, you are the heart of all of this right now because you have the ear of all of these people who are trying to become the next president. Talk their language, especially right now in this climate. Talk their language. If you think about small businesses, large businesses, that's where people are. We want, we want to save money for the businesses. We don't want to overtax them. Well, think about these numbers. Just for taking care of caregivers, businesses spend $37 billion a year because the caregivers have to take time off from work to take care of their loved one. They themselves get sick from stress-related um, disorders. $37 billion a year just for caregiving expenses to businesses. What about Medicare? We all talk about Medicare going bankrupt, or we have to do things to save Medicare. Well, the, the last numbers I know, and uh, Jim, you, you might have newer ones, was all the way back in 2005, Medicare itself spent $91 billion a year for beneficiaries with Alzheimer's disease. That's expected to go up to uh, around 190 billion in just the next three years or so. Those are the numbers we need to talk about. You know, the number that Jim talked about, the overall expense for Alzheimer's care in this country, that's over a quarter of what the entire stimulus bill was. Those are the types of numbers that politicians will listen I, to. I want to add, and I'm sure Jim could comment on this, that I never see a de debate where anyone asks a question about what's the national program for Alzheimer's disease. So Congress almost unanimously passed this new act, NAPA, to have a program against Alzheimer's disease, mobilize the world, no dollars, zero dollars. Of course, they say we don't have any dollars, but the point is that they have dollars for defense and they have dollars for other major programs, bailing out large banks or whatever it is. So without getting into the politics, why don't we ask the people on the campaign trail, what's your stated policy, your thought out policy for solving Alzheimer's during your eight years in the White House? What are you gonna really do about this? And we all know there isn't enough money, so where would you take the money? Uh, tell us straightforwardly, are you going to fund m many more grants for Alzheimer's research and encourage more trials, or are you really not gonna be able to do that? And tell the voters now that you can't do it. Just two, two other comments. Um, uh, just looking at Medicare, if we could, uh, some of the uh, the research trial that Dr. Salko was talking about, if we could, if we could have effective treatments that would essentially um, enable us to prevent Alzheimer's disease from developing, we could actually make Medicare solvent tomorrow. Um, so, um, really, really, uh, if you because because a person with uh, Alzheimer's disease costs Medicare three times as much as a person um, who is cognitively healthy. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the, the data and the facts are there. Uh, we, we, we know that. I agree we have to make the case uh, politically. I do want to make one last comment, which is uh, uh, Dr. Salko mentioned NAPA, the National Alzheimer's Project Act. <laughs> You're true. It, you are correct. It did not have funding. Um, I will say uh, in, in support of it, uh, it, Congress passed it unanimously in a lame duck session, which is pretty remarkable, um, um, last December, and President Obama signed it in January. This is the first time in the history of this nation that we now have both Congress and a president 
um, saying we should have a national plan to address Alzheimer's disease. So it, we are the plan, the people developing the plan, and it will be Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary uh, Health and Human Services, will not only address the areas of research, but will address the areas of caregiving and do we have the right resources to, to take care of people today with Alzheimer's. And no matter what happens on the research front, those numbers are going to be growing in the coming years. So it's really a comprehensive plan looking at the medical system, the failure to diagnose. Um, so I'm pleased that at least we have a recognition at the federal level that we need to address this issue. Um, the next, obviously, key piece of that is starting to put some dollars behind um, what will emerge as recommendations from that plan. We'd like to open the floor. So if anyone has questions, we have a microphone. Yes. Sure. And we have a mic so that your voice will carry. I was just thinking, is there a genetic connection? You know, I had a brother that passed away from a couple of years ago. Can I look forward to that? Uh, not necessarily. That's the good news. Um, the way the genetics works in short is that there are genes that can heighten your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease. But the ones that are really strong genes, it's very unlikely anyone in this room carries one of those faulty genes. So the only gene that's commonly causing Alzheimer's disease in our society is called ApoE. We don't offer testing for that until there is a treatment that we can actually give someone with that. Uh, but even with APOE or E4, uh, many people who have that gene never get the disease. So the answer to your question is just because your brother had Alzheimer's disease by no means me means that you're going to have an unusually high likelihood. It depends on other people in your family. One relative with Alzheimer's doesn't make a strong enough family history for us to say you really have to worry about it. If you have three relatives or five relatives with Alzheimer's, if they're in multiple generations, you need to sit down with an expert in the disease, and there are plenty of them in the listening area of this station, uh, and talk about what is my risk because five of my family members have the disease. And sometimes we even do test for this particular gene, ApoE4. That's the only common gene in people above age 60 or 65 that causes Alzheimer's. So it's a very, uh, you know, questionable issue. If you have a family history, it does not mean automatically that you'll get it yourself, but obviously you need to discuss it with a physician. We have a, I think we have a mic going around. There's someone right here. Pink. If you could please stand when you give your question. Right here, pink sweater. So I'd like to know, what do you say to a healthy 35-year-old with a family history of a couple of relatives with Alzheimer's, and they say to you, what can I do to prevent this from happening? Anyone ever see the movie Sleeper from Woody Allen? <laughs> Where after I don't know how many years of <laughs> being cryogenically preserved, he wakes up and he finds out that eating beef is actually good for you, <laughs> chocolate is good for you, all these things that, well, we now actually have good evidence that dark chocolate is good for you. We now actually have evidence that Mm -hmm. uh, moderate drinking, especially red wine, might, if, as long as it's not contraindicated by other problems that you have, might be good for you, including Alzheimer's disease. There's all kinds of these things that might be helpful to prevent. Um, none of them have been proven at all, though. There was a, um, a meeting um, held by NIH last year that looked at all the evidence of these prevention approaches for Alzheimer's disease, and the bottom line was there's no good evidence that anything really works. There's need for more research. But of the ones that seem to have the best support are the ones that we all already think about for other diseases, too, exercise. That's probably the most well-studied, both in animals and in humans, to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, certain types of diets, like the Mediterranean diet, where it's high in omega-3 fatty acids and like uh, is found in uh, certain types of fish and good fruits and vegetables, low, small amount of red meat. All those kinds of things that might be good for your heart are likely also good for preventing um, Alzheimer's disease, either from developing or from moving along too quickly. But nothing is proven at this point. In general, stay healthy. Do the best you can to keep the rest of your body healthy, um, and you might be helping your brain down the road. 
There are two other factors I'd add, and that is uh, absolutely right. Exercise is really important. Uh, social connectedness, uh, being really part of uh, a society that is nurturing and loving and, and that you matter to, that uh, seems to be a factor also that can lessen the likelihood that someone will get a dementia. And uh, think, thinking a lot. Uh, so there's actually quite good evidence that more complex uh, tasks in life, more complex requirements uh, for you to do in work, the workplace, for example, are generally good. Uh, that, and uh, Bob's right, the, the evidence is not definitive, but both in animals and uh, in humans, there is some evidence that looks like it's trending towards the notion that a lot of cognitive engagement and social engagement in life and being connected is certainly better for staving off Alzheimer's disease if you're in your 30s and you have a family history than the opposite. Not being engaged, taking it easy, taking retirement at 30, that's not the way to go. <laughs> and, and also, if I could just add, that, that cognitive stimulation, it doesn't mean just doing crossword puzzles for the right. rest of your life. It means shaking it up a little bit. If you've been doing something a certain way, do something new. Take on new hobbies. At talk, work, take on something different. We talk about you know, uh, trying to learn a new language, uh, mm -hmm. doing something that's really going to stretch yourself. Um, yeah. I think it's safe to say uh, retiring at age 30 and moving to Alaska um, in a cabin all by yourself and not getting any exercise you'll, you'll and, awesome. and eating terribly is not a good thing. <laughs> so. so what if it weren't Alaska? <laughs> um. <laughs> it could be Pittsfield. Well, okay. <laughs> We have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, right here, yes. Uh, I'm Bruce Bender, I'm a pathologist, and my wife and I have been doing uh, in-home non-medical senior care for 15 years. And I want to sort of lay out in a small issue, which is that when I went to medical school, Alzheimer's was defined as something that old people don't get. Um, it's a pre-senile, rapidly progressive dementia. Now, I don't want to argue about who really has Alzheimer's or not, but I am concerned that there are many, many seniors that we see who've been told they have Alzheimer's disease, and they don't. They're taking too many medications, they have cerebrovascular disease, they have cardiac disease, they're isolated, and I'm afraid that the stories of the original rare cases of Alzheimer's have led to this fear and a lot of mislabeling. And what I'd like to know is how we can get closer to a more honest approach to the seniors and the hundred or so causes of senile dementia that are out there, so that what can be treated is treated. So it's a, it's a very good question uh, from a physician who knows the pathology from, from your own training and experience. But I will say as someone who's been in, in the field for you know, 35 years or so, that we did have uh, objective misunderstandings back then as much as we do now. What we called Alzheimer's back then was a pre-senile dementia, and that was a misunderstanding. When Blessed Tomlinson and Roth in 1968 published their landmark study that many people who died in a nursing home in their 70s or 80s with dementia, with mental failure, had the same disease that Alzheimer had seen in a woman who was 53. Um, we then learned by doing autopsies that an awful lot of late life dementia was indeed correctly called Alzheimer's. Now we know the numbers. About out of 100 Americans who have uh, progressive cognitive failure uh, after the age of 70 or so, about half of those will turn out to have uh, either pure Alzheimer's disease at autopsy or Alzheimer's plus other changes with the Alzheimer's changes being very prominent. And then maybe another half will have some Alzheimer changes, but one can't be sure that was the real cause of the dementia. And they may have multiple strokes. Now, as Jim said earlier, strokes are generally going down, and they're also going down as a cause of dementia. So I would, honestly speaking and with respect, take issue with the general premise of your question. Some years ago, we were mistaking 
senile dementia and Alzheimer's. Now we have better diagnostic methods. If you go to a specialty center where they know what they're doing, and there are many around here, they'll make a diagnosis clinically of Alzheimer's versus frontotemporal dementia versus Lewy body dementia versus multi-infarct dementia, et cetera, and they'll be right. Uh, we've reported our numbers 95% of the time. And now with the advent of these remarkable diagnostic tests imaging the brain, admittedly just for research, but within years they'll be generally used, my opinion is that if anything we're under-diagnosing Alzheimer's disease even though some people are incorrectly diagnosed. They're just given the label of Alzheimer's when they have another dementia. One has to go to a specialty center to try to sort that out. So that's my opinion that we're not grossly over-diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, even though the term is so widely thrown around. A lot of what we thought before was uh, other kinds of dementia turns out uh, to be Alzheimer's because strokes have gone down, et cetera. And I, one question in the back for someone who had their hand up earlier, and then we'll go to the front row. So. Hi, uh, thank you for being here and for all the work that you're doing in the field. I had a quick question. I know you mentioned it's only about 5% of cases that are of the early onset variety, but I don't think I'm the only one in the room that's being affected by early onset Alzheimer's. So I was just wondering, though all cases are different, if you have been able to generalize about the difference in progression and uh, presentation of the disease in the early onset versus those who um, get the disease after age 65. Let me see if I can tackle part of that. Um, I think there's some misuse of terms through the years as we're growing to know more about the disease. And what used to be termed early onset is now more commonly within the field referred to as familial. Those few families around the world who carry one of these three genes that cause the disease, that if you have it, you'll get the disease. And like Dennis was saying, it affects people in their 20s, 30s, 40s. There are more and more people, however, who are developing the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and being diagnosed in their 50s. And I think that's, that affects a lot, of us, a lot of us here. And those people may not have or likely don't have one of those very rare genetically caused diseases. They might just be on, you know, there's a normal curve of most things. And yes, the majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease are diagnosed with, with the dementia between 65 and 80. But there's still people who likely will start showing the symptoms at an earlier age, perhaps in their 50s who have a younger onset um, and our, the surveillance has improved so much and our own awareness of it is, has improved so much. Um, but I think that there really is a difference between what used to be called early onset, meaning younger than 65, um, and what we now see as being the familiar genetically caused disease with more and more people being um, showing a, a routine or idiopathic kind of disease in their 50s. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree. And I, I will also say that for anyone who is suffering from early onset Alzheimer's disease, you are acutely in our thoughts. I mean, the research community globally is very concerned about early onset Alzheimer's disease, just as they are about what we often call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Again, not so obviously familial in, in late life. And we wish to treat uh, patients with early onset disease at the same time as we're developing treatments for uh, more common Alzheimer's disease. I just came from a conference where there's a plan to have at least two clinical trials just intended for people with a family history of Alzheimer's disease, which is wonderful. Uh, and uh, those are going to be hard trials to do. The patients often uh, may not progress so rapidly, and you may need to treat them for 24 months, 30 months, 36 months, et cetera. And you're also going to be treating people who often otherwise are very healthy. They're 35 or 40 or 45, and uh, that's not always true, obviously, with 75-year-old people who have Alzheimer's. They have other medical problems as well. So we're particularly sensitive to not uh, really mess up someone's life because they're 35 and they go on an experimental drug. Um, that's true of all patients, but we have to be particularly careful with people who are just on the cusp of symptoms or are almost asymptomatic. So not to worry, we're worried a lot about uh, young onset disease, and it's been actually enormously 
uh, path blazing for us to understand the biology, to be able to uh, work with people who have early onset. And also, I, I just want to add, um, um, beyond the research side, uh, at the Alzheimer's Association, we're seeing a lot more families that are coming to us. Uh, certainly, uh, 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 Ralph Kelly and his wife uh, Ruth have taken advantage of, of uh, programs at the Alzheimer's Association. And I would say across the country, there's a much gr greater recognition um, that this Alzheimer's is not just an old person's disease, although it still is predominantly, but we have a growing number, uh, particularly of uh, families in their 50s with, a, with a, a one member of the family has Alzheimer's disease. So we're developing programs. We're also pushing on the public sector that there be more uh, uh, support uh, for, for families. Obviously, um, um, the fa family member with the younger onset Alzheimer's often is out of the workplace. Uh, you have one spouse home who's trying to work, trying to take care uh, of their um, partner. Uh, there might be children in the home, um, and we saw a lot of that in the opening um, series that, um, um, of the WBUR series. It's hard, so we're very committed to doing what we can to, to assist families um, through that um, journey. A question in the front row right here. Thank you very much for giving your time this evening. Uh, my name is Ed Lynch. My mother passed away at 83. Uh, she was in a nursing home, and um, I would go to visit her in the evening, and my brother had, would, would have just been in the, uh, uh, the room with her and walked out, and I caught him in the hall, hall, and I would say, you know, hi, Greg, how's mom today? And he'd say, oh, she's, you know, she's doing all right. I would go into the room no longer than three minutes later and say, hi, mom, how are you doing? Oh, just fine, dear. Anybody been in to visit you today? Not a soul, dear, not a soul. But she could tell you what dress she wore in 1939 at the, you know, the picnic or something like that. Um, would distant memory be, uh, you know, having cognitive distant mem memories not be a, uh, impaired by Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's one that causes a lot of confusion amongst most people, that the parts of the brain that are hurt in Alzheimer's disease, especially um, early on and then gets really hurt, a part called the hippocampus, is responsible for making new memories, for learning something new. Those old memories aren't that easy to get rid of. They're really, sometimes we wish we could. But it's really hard to get rid of, you know, memories from that wedding day, or who was our first grade teacher, or how, you know, what dress I wore to the, pro what, all those things that you're bringing up. Those are not usually affected by Alzheimer's disease, especially early on, because they're stored in a much more complex web around the brain, really hard to get rid of. But even those things can be hurt as the disease progresses and more and more brain tissue is being devastated. But the hallmark memory problem with Alzheimer's disease is the inability to learn something new and to rapidly forget it. So what you're describing with you and your brother is exactly what happens with a person with Alzheimer's disease, is the inability to make that new memory. But remembering those things from the past hard to get rid of. Until the disease advances, right. and then many memories are lost, uh, what the names of your children are, the names of your grandchildren, et cetera. But, and actually, uh, you may have experienced this, uh, a perfectly, uh, mm -hmm. a, a really wonderful way to engage someone with Alzheimer's disease um, is to talk about those old memories. Uh, you know, we often have families um, will come to us and say, well, you know, uh, my father wants to talk about his mother, but she's been dead for 40 years. Um, so, you know, so what? Um, if, 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 if you can have a positive conversation that's evoking a positive emotion and a positive feeling, um, um, what a wonderful thing. Um, and if, if, if you can tolerate it, if you have to have the same conversation every day uh, of every week, um, that's hard for you. But on the other hand, you're having a positive interaction. Um, and in this case, your mom is, 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 is feeling good about herself and good about her life, um, the quality of her life at that moment. Um, it's the reality of that person's life. They're living in the moment. And so to try to take that away and to try to say, uh, no, mom, you know, your son was just here 10 minutes ago. Of course you remember that. No, just say, oh. But I'm here now. And then taking out a photo album to look at those old memories or to take out music that 
she loved from the, from the 40s um, that she can then sing along with, things that are still part of her. That's what living in the moment and improving quality of life is all about. There's a question against that far wall, I believe, yes. Yeah, hi, thank you for all your work. Um, first, uh, your, the music absolutely does work. My 85-year-old father can still sing the harmony part to the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> And I road tested that watching the fireworks when there was no other music, um, <laughs> and he's amazing. And otherwise, his mind is almost completely gone, which is very sad. But um, I have a couple of questions. One is, um, how do people get involved in research? Um, you know, my sister and I are in our 50s, and uh, we might be great research subjects. And uh, two concerns that I'd have are, can it be absolutely confidential? Because in the private insurance market, uh, presumably there's still a lot of discrimination or at least a very uh, steep increase in costs if, there's, if the a, a word is anywhere in your record or your family history. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's perceived, I think, to be an opportunity cost because what if you're the placebo subject? And you know, you're on a trial with a great drug, but you have to be on it for years and years and you miss out getting. So anyway, that's one thing. But um, my other question is, what are your, what's the research community's thinking about, um, lately, about the causes of Alzheimer's? Um, for example, um, I've read in the popular press that there might be some thought that it's sort of the immune system of the brain gone haywire. And I'd be interested to hear more about that. Thank you. I'll take that last one. Jim, you want to say something about research? And yeah, I'll just, I'll start on that. three of us can chime in on this one. Um, so, so from the Alzheimer's Association point of view, we're, we also, uh, I would echo what uh, Bob Stern was saying, is that we need more volunteer participants in research. So the fact that, that you and your sister, did you say? Um, um, that's terrific, thank you. Uh, so two things that uh, those who are here and those that are, are, are listening and watching um, um, tonight on, on, the, on the web, uh, one is called the Alzheimer's Association. So one of the things that we do do, um, we have a 24-hour uh, uh, number, um, is that we help people um, navigate though, that world and that question around what kind of research uh, uh, trials would you want to be interested in participating. By the way, I, I want to also say not all research, although we are talking about um, research that will um, is leading right now to drug uh, uh, trial interventions. There is research on caregiving strategies. There's research on end of life and hospice care. There's a number of, of a range. There, there's a, a multicultural research going on. So there's a, a number of areas that we're uh, collectively, we being the research community, are trying to figure out. So, so what may not appeal, to one, one slice of the pie that may not be appetizing to you, there might be another slice that you want to yeah, you consider. Second thing is that we do have an online system called Trial Match. Uh, um, again, you can access through that through the uh, uh, website of the Alzheimer's Association, alz.org. Um, and that's an online uh, program where you can uh, put in your personal information, uh, put in information about what kind of researcher might be willing to participate in, uh, put in answer questions around how far you'd be willing to travel, um, and you will, you will get some feedback in terms of those trials that are um, open um, and are recruiting. So I would say there's online possibilities. There, uh, you can call the Alzheimer's Association, and you certainly can be checking here in Massachusetts uh, at all the major medical centers. Uh, we have two Alzheimer's disease research centers: one, one um, um, which Bob is affiliated with, BU, and one um, at Harvard with the uh, Mass General um, network of researchers that are incredibly active uh, in, in in research. So, one of the things we often say is Alzheimer's is a terrible disease. But if you have to have it, Massachusetts is one of the best places uh, to have it. So, uh, I echo everything uh, that Jim is saying and um, underscore the importance of the Alzheimer's Association as a resource for all things. Um, Google. If you Google Boston Alzheimer's or Boston Alzheimer's research, you will come up with a lot of really good things. Um, you may come up with our center at the top, which I aim for. Um, but uh, Google and you'll find that there are so many different types of research studies that people can get involved with. You mentioned before the, the issue of, well, what if I'm on a, pl on a placebo? Well, that's what research is all about, unfortunately. The, the way we test things is to be able to make sure that it's not caused, you know, any effect is not caused by something else. Many of the studies, however, these days are doing two different things to avoid that problem of only being on a placebo. 
One is that they're increasing the percentage of people on the active drug. So it might be two-thirds getting the active drug and one-third getting the placebo. The other thing is that if the drug is looking like it's okay, it's not causing any harm, the studies are still going on, there's what's called an open label form of the, of the trial. So after you have finished the typically 18-month portion of the trial, then everyone who wants to can go on the active agent. So even if you might have been on the placebo before, everyone now will be openly on the active agent. So there are so many ways for people to get involved in research. Well, again, like whether it's a clinical trial or uh, you know, figuring out how to drive safer or how to assess it, figuring out how to diagnose it. There's lots of studies that just require one or two or three visits to help us being able to diagnose the disease early. So many different ways. And in terms of your question about causes, uh, clearly Alzheimer's is what we call a syndrome in medicine. It's not a single disease. Uh, like some, like Huntington's disease, for example, is due to one gene defect, and you have to have that gene defect to get the disease. You can't get it another way. Alzheimer's is not like that. It's multifactorial. Um, many of us in the field, over 30 years of research, have gravitated to the notion that, in considerable part, it's a buildup of this amyloid protein. That's why the drug companies, who don't care whose theory is right, they care about this, right? Uh, and they also care about helping people, but. At the end of the day, they're companies, and they have to pay their stock their stockholders. They're uh, voting with their dollars and doing a lot of trials on uh, amyloid, and I really hope they'll do trials on other things, because I don't, even though I've worked on the amyloid protein, I think there's many other worthy uh, targets. You mentioned inflammation as being one of them. No question there's inflammation in the brain. Not the same uh, as inflammation when you get a splinter under your uh, thumb and, and it, you get a boil there, not quite the same as rheumatoid arthritis inflammation, but there is an inflammatory process. We believe that much of that inflammation is triggered by the buildup of this amyloid protein, so it might still be good to get rid of the inflammation by getting rid of the amyloid, but we don't yet know if that's going to really help symptoms. There are many shots on goal, but when you only get five out of 100 ideas getting funded by the taxpayers, how do you ever get those shots into the net? Uh, question right here in the second row. Do you think that brain injury can have anything to do with the onset of Alzheimer's? We have an expert right here. So. <laughs> my husband uh, had an injury to in his eye. He died of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. so I have heard that sometimes these football players are developing similar signs. Um, so there wasn't a mic that, to repeat the question. It was, mm -hmm. can a head injury cause Alzheimer's disease? Um, and you mentioned that you've been hearing about football players dying with what seems to be uh, Alzheimer's disease or something. So um, I used to be a big believer in some of the epidemiological studies that said that people with a history of traumatic brain injury were at a greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease later on. And in fact, it was by saying that in a lecture one day, someone heard me say it and went home to his roommate, who uh, a gentleman by the name of Chris Nowinski, uh, and he said, you've got to talk to this guy, because this gentleman, Chris, was the person who really is responsible for opening up the world's eyes to the relationship between getting your head hit in sports and developing some problems later in life. And we then forged a partnership, and we developed a center at BU doing this research. What we know about those athletes, at least, is that having a history of repetitive brain trauma, whether it's concussions or even subconcussive hits to the head, can, in some people, bring on a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, that is one of those other degenerative brain diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, like frontotemporal dementia, like Lewy body disease, another disease that eventually takes over the brain, destroys the brain tissue, and will lead eventually to dementia. Um, so whether a single traumatic brain injury early in life increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease, that research is actually not that great. And in fact, most of it never looked at the brain afterwards to formally diagnose Alzheimer's disease. And so my guess is that at least a, some of that has to do with this other disease called CTE. Let's go on this side, um, on the very front row, yes. 
Um, you were mentioning uh, red wine, so I had a question about alcohol. Uh, two questions. I think that's after the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how does alcohol affect the long-term acceleration of Alzheimer's? And I find with my mom, actually, if she has a glass of wine and she's quite developed in al Alzheimer's, she is able to connect more. Um, she's able to engage more. Now, is there any scientific basis to that? I can answer part of that, and hopefully Dennis can answer it for real. <laughs> Um, the research suggests that prior to any cognitive difficulties, so in someone who's cognitively healthy, no evidence of dementia or anything, that one or two drinks, if okay otherwise for other health reasons, might do something to um, slow down the likelihood of getting dementia later on. That research also suggests that if you do more than that, it can actually accelerate the likelihood of, of showing something later. And it also suggests that if after you've already started showing cognitive impairment and you continue to drink, it might worsen the cognitive impairment. How? That's uh, one, not enough research is there to say it. But the, the other side of it is that um, if someone is already showing dementia and their life is in the moment and it's important to have social connections, to just be able to have a great quality of life. And if, like in your mom's case, it improves that connection, then, you know, why not, I guess? That, how's that for a scientific answer? <laughs> why not? Um, I get this question all the time from my families, and I usually say it's fine to have mom or dad have a glass of wine. I would not go a lot beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to watch out. Does it make her a little bit more lively, a little bit less inhibited in some way? Some of my patients, when they come, they come to a clinic, um, perform particularly well, and their families say, I don't know how you got him to do that. He never says anything. He just, he just sits around. And with you, he was very engaged. But some of my patients do the opposite. They clam up and they're very nervous. They're anxious to be in front of a doctor. And I bet you those people might be a little more comfortable if they you know, used alcohol, which disinhibits everyone uh, at a certain level. So we have glasses of wine in my clinic waiting for the patients. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to drum up business. <laughs> uh, question here. Uh, like pink. That's good. What, what causes some Alzheimer's patients who were previously very sweet and kind, to become nasty and aggressive and unkind? Well, um, we, we believe that it's the same biology that causes them to be forgetful. So the plaques and the tangles and the inflammation gets into areas of the brain, certain structures that have fancy names like the amygdala and sometimes the thalamus and other areas that stops their sense of the right and wrong thing to do in life, the way to use words. We all know of even women, certainly men, who end up swearing a lot and making inappropriate jokes and things of that sort. And I have one patient uh, who, uh, whose wife is really frustrated that he, he always makes inappropriate comments at social events, and she's got a code with him to tamp that down, you know. Uh, she asked me if there's a medicine I could uh, give him. And I said, whatever medicine we would give him, we'd have to suppress his overall sensorium so much that he wouldn't make jokes anymore, but he wouldn't converse either. He wouldn't be fun to be with. So that is a sign that the disease biologically, uh, in general terms, has affected parts of the brain and connections among different brain areas that are important for proper emotional control, proper understanding of your situation in life compared to other people's situation in life, this lack of caring about how other people feel, uh, that happens a lot. People love to debate whether that's just coming out and the person was sort of always <laughs> like that. Some of my family say, mom had that streak. When, when I was a kid, as a teenager, she came down on me really hard. Of course, so did my mom. Uh, and, and the fact is that I think it's not so much that. I don't think it's a recrudescence of an old personality trait. I think the disease itself has this biology. And what all of you know, and what everyone who's listening needs to remember, is that this is a biologic condition. It's really not a 
psychologic condition in the usual way that society uses that. My own view of the nervous system is that everything psychological and psychiatric is nerve brain function at the end of the day, but we tend to still separate psychiatric, psychological disorders from neurological disorders. But the psychological symptoms of Alzheimer's are due to brain wiring abnormalities, and it's not the patient's fault, and you have to remember that. Just like I tell my families, you wouldn't have uh, a spouse with rheumatoid arthritis, and they'd be walking up the stairs, you'd be behind them saying, get going, Sam, you, you walk so slowly, why don't you move along here, get up the stairs. You could, of course, would never say that, because you could see that their joints were hurting. It's the same thing here, you can't do much about the terrible difficulty they have in making emotional connections and understanding their behavior, you just have to distract them. Distracting is the number one thing when they're behaving badly, is to change the subject completely, get them interested in a, a photo, a song, a television program, and just go away from that negative thing that they're talking about. It's important to note, though, that not everyone develops that kind right. of behavior. And in fact, some people report just the flip side. You know, mm -hmm. dad was an old curmudgeon his whole life, and now he's this docile, wonderful guy. And they say, this is, this is a positive thing. That's at least as common as the opposite. That's right. Mm -hmm. And what that tells us is what we see in all of the different symptoms, is that it's a very individualized disease. Every person shows the disease a different way. And I think just a, a last thing to add to that, um, one of the challenges in taking your question is that you have a lifetime of family dynamics and history, and this sort of gets to what uh, Dennis was talking about uh, on the psychological side. So it is important, the same with the rheumatoid arthritis example, to remember this is a disease. This is not your spouse finally getting back at you um, because you moved from beautiful Honolulu to Milwaukee, and why did you, you know, uh, so you have to, you have to remember, this is a disease that, that is, 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 is ravaging the brain, and so that the behaviors that you're struggling with at that particular moment are because of that, not because of some deep-seated animosity um, or other familial issues that might go back uh, 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 decades. We have time for one more question. For those of you we didn't get to, there may be some availability to chat later. Uh, let's do the very back row. Yes. Thank you. My, my question is surrounding um, a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment that a friend has gotten. Um, if you look on the Alzheimer's website, that's in stage three of the um, stages progressing to, uh, through Alzheimer's. Yet the person didn't get a uh, direct diagnosis of Alzheimer's at the, t at the current time. So just a little confusion as to what the um, relationship is to the MCI diagnosis to um, full-blown Alzheimer's and what's, what is it in that stage three that uh, shows it on the line of uh, Alzheimer's? That, that's such a wonderful question. For those of you who haven't heard of the term mild cognitive impairment, it's a term that was coined many years ago to talk about the point between normal, healthy cognitive aging and full-blown dementia. Well, none of these things are really clear. In fact, they're really fuzzy. And sadly, the state of clinical diagnosis of things like that is not that great. You know, when I was telling you before that the, the definition of dementia means that you have cognitive impairments, memory difficulties that are bad enough to get in the way of daily life, well, the main thing that distinguishes mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, and dementia is that the problems that the person has aren't yet getting in the way of daily life. That's a real fuzzy line. And so we, we use that term of MCI because of the concept that Dennis was talking about, that the earlier we could treat people in the disease course, the better those treatments are likely to work. So if we could pick a point in time where the person isn't that badly impaired, in other words, no dementia, the treatment might work. So that's why MCI started being used. Right now, it's used sometimes clinically, a lot of the times in research, to be able to figure out who's going to progress to full-blown dementia, who's going to look like they have the Alzheimer's type of dementia. 
with those new types of diagnostic procedures that are now being used to be able to look at amyloid in the brain, measure amyloid and tau in the spinal fluid, that term of MCI is now being switched around a little bit where we can say it's MCI of Alzheimer's disease because we know it's the disease that's causing it. And so some people with the diagnosis of MCI might actually never get worse. Some people might actually get better. Some people, though, will progress to an Alzheimer's dementia. Um, the, di the definition of that MCI thing is that you have a complaint, you have a problem, you have a memory difficulty, your loved one confirms it, says that you have it, or your doctor has been observing a change over time. And then you get formal assessment of those difficulties, and lo and behold, the testing says that, yeah, you actually do have memory problems greater than your age but it's not getting in the way of your life. That's what MCI is. So in the future, this newer diagnosis of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease is going to be really important because it's the prodromal phase of the disease that will be able to really examine whether drugs work better at that point. We want to thank all of you for coming. It, as I said, it's possible that Dr. Salko and Dr. Stern and Jim Wessler may be here for a bit afterwards if you wanted to try to catch them and ask them questions. Thanks for coming. As you head out, there possibly could be some food still in the kitchen if you didn't yeah. grab some coming in. And I also want to say thanks to Iris Adler. This really was her, this was her baby. This was her brainchild. It was a great <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate that you all came out tonight. Good job. Thank As you. always, excellent. Thank you. Went well, huh? Thank you very much. Thank you again. Absolutely.